honorable. In Ghana, everyone is an honorable, even if they are not honorable. But the gentleman who just introduced me uh, is one of the most honorable ministers in our generation, and we look forward to seeing more of you. I've been given an assignment to speak about missions. I was preceded by Ben Ajenin Watten, who gave a fascinating presentation. If you haven't listened intently, you need to listen to it again. Listen to the statistics and know why we need to rethink missions, we as Africans. I've been debating what message to share, and uh, to be very honest with you, I slept for only two hours. Last night, uh, I was very troubled because the two previous speakers uh, last night, Maziboko from South Africa and Godswill TK Mensa from Ghana, they literally disrupted the system. They created a problem for us. And if you are not serious, if you don't think, uh, you'll be troubled. And so I want to commend both of you for literally disrupting us. We cannot effect changes unless we are shaken up. And that is what they did yesterday. Literally disrupting religion as we know it in, in Africa. Disrupting even the church. Some of the practices we are engaging which evidences that often we don't think. And if we think at all, we don't think are right or properly. So I've been wondering, after such disruption, what message should I share? And so I had already planned what I was going to say. I said I'm going to talk about Africa must think outside the box when it comes to missions. Because we are repeating the same old thing to the villages and doing all of this, and nothing seems to be working. So I wanted to say we must rethink missions by thinking outside the box. That was what I had in mind. And I had this in mind because uplift is an attempt to change mindsets and to uplift mindsets for change. I've said two things. Uplift seeks to change mindsets and to uplift mindsets for change. It is based on the fundamental conviction that nothing should prevent us from changing our realities. That include missions. We need to change and be willing to change where necessary. Nothing should prevent us. That's fundamental conviction number one. And the second conviction is we must adopt a can-do spirit. We can do it. And this can-do spirit is grounded in the ability of a God who can do it. So that was the framework of what I wanted to share. But last night, I just couldn't sleep. I was troubled after yesterday's two messages. And so in the morning, I decided to present a different message, even though I'll bring out some ideas of what I originally had in mind. My message is entitled, Invent the Future. If you want a longer title, it is Changing Mindsets in Order to Invent the Future. What did I say the title is? Invent the future. You can invent the future. You can write history by living it now. Invent the future. And there will be two points I will be making towards the end. Africa must think in order to invent the future, and Africa must do. And this is based on the sons of Issachar, a group of 200 leaders who are uh, concerning whom we are told in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The sons of Issachar had understanding of the times. They had discernment. They could think. And they also knew what Israel ought to do. They could do. 
And so on the basis of these two, I would argue that Africa must think, Africa must do, and when it comes to missions, these are non-negotiable. Originally, I told you I was thinking of a message, and that message, I wanted to apply an Independence Day message I presented some five years ago here in Ghana. Ghana was celebrating its 65th anniversary of independence, and the theme that was chosen was Ghana Beyond Aid. It's a nice, catchy phrase. And by the way, this has been picked up all over Africa, and now we have foundations called Africa Beyond Aid. There is even one young professionals group in Ghana called Africa Beyond Aid. 18, uh, 2018, I came here to Ghana, and I spoke to those groups. They were students, young SRC leaders, Students' Representative Council for the various universities, previous and past. Ghana Beyond Aid. So I wanted to use... Uh, President Akufuado's statement to present a rather radical message. And the message was to have been Africa must rethink its missions by not depending on mission practices we have imported and by importing and sticking to ideas that are no longer working or are irrelevant. I was going to challenge the mindset of dependency. And ladies and gentlemen, Africa and the church in Africa, including my own church, Seventh Day Adventist Church, we are still stuck with a mindset of dependency. And anyone who dares to challenge the status quo is branded a troublemaker. And so I wanted to make a case that we need to rethink missions. And I have on the slide President Akufuado when he met the president of France, Macron, and President Akufuado gave him a nice lecture. The substance of his lecture, which went viral, is Akufuado said, Africa is rich and we don't need to seek aid. Sounds nice, isn't it? So Ghana beyond aid. It quickly became Africa beyond aid. And in President Akufuado's message, he was talking about economics. And he said, the Ghana that I am seeking with your support is a Ghana beyond aid. A Ghana that will free itself from the mindset of handout. A Ghana bent on mobilizing its own resources to solve her problems. So he came up with four pillars of his economic recovery, revenue or domestic resource mobilization, expenditure management, finance management, creation of opportunities, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, despite all of this, Ghana is still dependent. IMF was here a couple of weeks ago. It didn't work. Something happened. But I like the phrase, Ghana beyond aid, Africa beyond aid. When it came up, I jumped on it and went to University of Cape Coast to give a lecture to the students. And the title of the lecture was Africa Must Think. And as soon as I landed in Ghana, the student leaders, the SRC leaders, the previous students and current SRC leaders and new ones incoming said, okay, come to Accra and give us a similar lecture. So I went to Legon, University of Ghana, at the Faculty of Law Auditorium. The leaders met there, and I presented a similar message. I began by telling them an experience I had at the University of Cape Coast. When you go to the University of Cape Coast, there are all these wonderful apartments and guest houses, and right there on campus is this Sakawa, you know, uh, guest house. As soon as you enter the guest house, there is a plaque. And the plaque, the vice chancellor then, uh, Nana Jane Ajiman, whatever, the, 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 the vice presidential candidate of the opposition party, she was at that time the vice uh, chancellor of the university. She had a big, wonderful plaque. And she said, this facility you see, this guest house, was built with our own resources 
without dependence on outside sources. That was good. Ghana beyond aid. And so, I walked through the facility, nice facility. I went to the soccer house where I was going to stay. Nice building. The bed was neat, the bed sheet clean and white. The shower, Bob, you know, the, the shower, I counted it. There were 96 holes in the shower. And I turned on the water, and they all were wetting. I said, wow, this is Ghana beyond aid. Then in the morning, I went for breakfast. And when I went to the breakfast, <laughs> on the table was a scene that made me laugh. There was cornflakes. There was sugar, Nescafe, milk, etc., etc. And then I started analyzing it. Cornflakes, it doesn't come from Ghana. The sugar was imported from Malaysia. The milk, I look at it, is from Germany. The next cafe from Cote d'Ivoire. I started analyzing all, even the ketchup. Nothing there was from Ghana. And yet we have already advertised on a plaque, Ghana Beyond Aid. We did it ourselves. So I called the cafeteria folks. I said, Madam, don't you have any Ghanaian food? <laughs> the lady said, no, sir. I said, why not? She said, our people don't like Ghanaian food. I said, don't you have cocoa? Don't you have kose? Cape Coast people come here, tourists come here. They look at the slave castles. Bring them to University of Cape Coast to eat real Ghanaian food. You are giving us conflicts, etc., etc." She said, our people don't like it. I said, so what do you have? I said, I don't drink coffee. I don't want conflicts. What do you have? She said, okay, we can give you eggs and milo. Well, Thomas Sankara says, if you want to know whether a person is still colonized, look at what he eats at his breakfast table. Right there, I knew University of Cape Coast was still colonized. And I knew Ghana is colonized. I dare you, the breakfast you had this morning, chances are you betray the fact that your mind is still colonized. Thomas Sankara says, he who feeds you controls you. And he says, we have to work at decolonizing our mentality. I'm coming to my topic. You wait. So, they brought me the breakfast. Red, fried eggs, whatever. And then they brought Milo. I was reading a book by Nelson Mandela, you know, a biography of Mandela. I had it on the... And I analyzed it carefully also. The Milo... Do you know that Ghana doesn't produce Milo? You look at the label, and it tells you packaged in Ghana. It doesn't mean it was produced in Ghana. It was packaged in Ghana. We produce the cocoa, but we don't produce Milo. Let me say it differently. When you go to the market, you will see Milo displayed. Not only Milo, Ovaltine, Nairo, and all of this. And to make us drink a lot of Milo, I'm talking about the mindset. They advertise some Ghanaians playing football. The message, if you want to be a good footballer, drink Milo. If you want to be a good sportswoman, drink Milo. If you want to go for athletics, drink Milo. What you don't realize is somebody is setting us up to drink Milo so that the profit goes to that person and it happens to be Switzerland. Africa is not thinking. So they brought me this breakfast because they think Ghana, I'm a Ghanaian, I like Milo chocolate product, not knowing we have been brainwashed. See, we produce cocoa. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire alone, our next door neighbor, we produce two-thirds of all the cocoa in the world from which we get chocolate and chocolate products. If you add Nigeria and Cameroon, Literally, Africa produces almost 90% of all the cocoa from which we have over $1.3 billion industry, and yet we have less than 6% of the revenue. Why? Because we export the raw cocoa beans. And then somebody takes it at a very cheap price, processes it, and sells it to us, there are nine steps to produce chocolate. You see, you think today is church, so I shouldn't talk about economics and all of this. 
it has relevance because whether you like it or not, we have all been programmed and we need to decolonize our mindset. Let me skip this. Anyway, Ghana is trying to do something better. So they said, eat chocolate, drink Ghana cocoa, etc. So Valentine's Day, now we call it chocolate day. Eat Ghana, eat chocolate. And yet when you go to the store, we don't want to eat Ghana. We want to eat Switzerland. Mindset again. Ghana currently imports $2 billion worth of food per year, which is equivalent to what we earn from cocoa. Let me say it differently. We export cocoa, which is one of our cash crops. We earn $2 billion. But we import other food items worth $2 billion. We import rice. We import poultry. We import steamed tomatoes. We import onions from Burkina Faso. We import oil. Everything is imported. The imported mindset, the dependency syndrome is with us. And says Sam Jonah, who is the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, says, the chancellor, in the 1970s, we in Ghana used to have thriving industries in poultry, in textiles and road construction. Now, almost all our poultry is imported. More than 60% of our tilapia that we buy in the market comes from China. And of course, the construction industry is now predominantly foreign. We even got a foreign construction company to dig up the graves at Asunje Park. So when our heads of state die and we are going to bury them, the people who dig the graves from China. I'm talking about mindset, and it is affecting the church, the way we do church, and the way we do business. China is now producing yams and exporting yams. China is producing cocoa and exporting cocoa. China is producing cassava and even jollof rice. Something is wrong with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to you a problem. Because before we can solve any problem, we must understand the problem itself. We have become dependent. And so we need to rethink. Even missions and mission practices, the mindset we have about it. That's why I'm coming to talk to you about invent the future. Uh, ben Adenin, in his previous presentation, has given us reasons why we cannot continue doing church the way we have been doing it. A compelling case has been made. I'm coming to talk about why we are resisting change and why we can change and do things differently and there will be results. Invent the future. Changing our mindset to invent the future. I want to welcome all of you to this uh, function, the Uplift 2022, in case you are joining us. And I want to thank CAM, the Center for Outreach, Mentorship, and Empowerment, for hosting this event. Uplift. And then all the sponsors of this event, we thank all of you. What is Uplift and why? I want to set the lecture series throughout this weekend or this week into a bigger context and invite you to be part of a growing change on the continent. What is Uplift? Uplift is a grassroots movement of young professionals on the continent of Africa. It is a coalition of those who seek to be change makers. So those who are invited here are change makers. So from tomorrow, you are going to see other speakers who are impacting the continent, and we've invited them, come and help us change our mindset so Africa can be on course. Uplift is an alliance of transformation agents on the continent. And today and this week, we are inaugurating this group which embraces excellence, integrity, and service, and authentic spirituality. This is the Africa we've all been waiting for, and we welcome you to this event. The theme is much more, and you are going to see how it fits into what I'm coming to talk about, about missions. 
It is much more than a leadership training event, or innovation creativity seminar, a health or medical outreach, mission empowerment conference. Much more is more, or uplift, is much more than a musical concert or marriage seminar or a Bible study or prophecy seminar. It is much more than a revival. It is an attempt during the entire week to give highlights of areas where Africa needs to rethink. It is a call to come up higher. When you register or uplift, you see the byline, a call to come up higher. And the theme, much more. Why that theme? How does it relate to missions? You would notice the, the dictionary defines much as something that is a great deal, large amount, a good deal. I mean, something that is huge, many. That's the de definition of much. And more, the grammatical word of comparison, it is used to indicate greater than something, greater number than before, more than average, more than something else. The synonyms of more are, it is additional, extra, supplementary, etc., etc. Now, so when you combine these two words, both of which already implies moreness, together, much more means Something that far exceeds any expectation. See, much means a great deal, a great extent, a great degree. More means greater than before. Therefore, much more means it must far exceed expectation. The message Africa must begin to think and do things in far greater ways than we have imagined before. And if there's time, I'll take you to the Bible, and you are going to discover the phrase much more occurs some 43 times, just as a phrase, and then as a concept, it appears more times, and the biblical summary is, the phrase much more captures the concept of unlimited possibilities. It is a challenge to rise higher, go beyond our limits and expectations, far exceed anything, because God is able, God is willing to do much more for us. He expects much more for, from us. And for this to happen, we need a change in mindset. I've set the tone for today. Now, back to my point. Why should we invent the future when it comes to missions and our mindset? I need to let you know Africa has problems. We are pretending we are okay. The church is pretending it's okay. So we are all engaged in this culture of uh, deception, hypocrisy, pretending all is well. But all is not well. Africa's problem is the church's problem. Africa has a problem. And what is the problem? A mindset problem. What are the symptoms of this problem? Everyone knows that Africa cannot feed itself. We cannot treat our diseases. We cannot build our roads. We cannot educate our children. We cannot employ them or keep them engaged. In the midst of abundance, Africa still cannot do many things for Africa and Africans. And this great continent waits for others in the world to help it solve its problem. Dependency. Just like a man who has food but waits for somebody to chew the food for him and then spit it in his mouth to swallow. Africa is that person. We have food. It is there. We see it. it but we don't want to eat. We want some, somebody from outside, either from the East China or from the West America, US, whatever, uh, Europe, to come and chew the food for us, spit it in our mouth, and then for us to swallow. Mindset change, a culture of dependency. Let me give you specific examples, because the, the Bible message I'm going to give is very simple. But you would only appreciate it if, you, if I set it in the context of a bigger problem. Let me give you specific problem, examples of our problem. Instead of producing millionaires and billionaires, we've succeeded in producing millionaires and billionaires. I was giving a lecture in Zimbabwe. I wrote a book, Africa Must Think, and I stated that instead of Africa, which is the, the richest continent in the world, producing millionaires and billionaires, we've produced 
millionaires, millionaires, a person with nil, with nothing, millionaires. As soon as I finished the lecture, one Zimbabwean, if you know Zimbabweans, they have sense of humor. One person came, hey, Dr. Pippin, we are not only producing millionaires, people with nothing, we are producing illionaires. I said, what's that? He said, people who are ill, people who are sick. During the week, we'll be listening to a lecture on Africa's health, and you see that. We have a problem. We are constantly humiliated and exploited by the foreign embassies when we queue up for visas. We graduate some 500,000 in Ghana annually, yet most of them are unemployed and unemployable. We have more churches and mosques than schools and hospitals combined. We don't grow the food that is on our plates. We die in the deserts, we drown in the Mediterranean, and those who escape death are enslaved in Libya. Over 50 years after independence, we still enslave and sell our own people as slaves. We talk about youth empowerment and mentorship and leadership, yet a substantial majority of our leaders are above 70 years old, and they are not willing to transition to the younger leaders. It happens in government, it happens in schools, it happens also in the church. It's a problem. Our heroes in Africa are footballers in Europe. And so, when they play the European League, we in Africa, particularly Ghana, we run commentaries of the European League football in our own local languages. We own African football players. We have some good African football players who are doing well overseas, but we cannot move beyond the quarterfinals at World Cup. We still import a lot of things we use and need, including toilet roll, toothpick. We import even people from overseas to dig our graves and bury our dead. We have become a net exporter of finished goods. Sorry, we become a net importer of finished goods while we also are the net exporter of raw materials. We travel a lot to and from abroad, but we don't own a single aircraft. Yesterday, I picked someone from the airport, and I was telling them, do you know that the airline you came with, which has a country's name on it, that country doesn't own that aircraft? He was shocked. I said, yeah, that's Ghana too. Ghanaians travel a lot, but we don't own a single aircraft. We drive cars from everywhere, but we cannot manufacture a single bicycle tire. We don't believe in ourselves, and we entertain ourselves with European football. We know their names and the food they ate. We in Ghana import milk from Switzerland instead of from Kenya. We die in car accidents because of potholes on our roads. Why potholes? Because our engineers and road contractors do shoddy work. Corruption has killed more of our people than the Holocaust and the World War. And those who fight corruption are not short of enemies. Social media, that should be a medium of education and development, is being misused. We tweet, we Facebook, we WhatsApp, we Instagram, nonsense. We gain celebrity status by posing as nude. We insult others, I call it the malafaka mentality. That's what we use social media for. Instead of using the internet for trade, we trade and peddle gossip, hatred, and falsehood. The lecturer doesn't respond to ideas but emotions and bribery. Those who acquire power through ballot or bullet are corrupt. Our graduates cannot spell their name. There's poor sanitation everywhere. Our towns and cities are dirty, except Rwanda, and are choked by filth. We build houses and public places without toilet facilities. And yet we are outraged when other countries and one former president of America insulted us as shitholes. Which, by the way, the dictionary defines as a dumping ground for waste. Why wouldn't we be insulted when our continent has become the dumping ground for goods and waste from America, from Europe, and China, including ideas? This is the problem. In case we don't know, I have reminded you. But do you know, one of Africa's greatest problems are not these symptoms I've discussed. Our greatest problem is mindless religion. We don't think. And yesterday, that case was made compellingly, and that is what got me troubled. Masibuko, Tello, and God's will made that case much more than religion. Mindless religion. 
I wrote a book some time ago. I was giving the Independence Day lecture in Nigeria at Lagos State Chamber of Mines. And um, the convener of the event is a journalist, Bamidele Ademola Olatehu. And she later on wrote an article critiquing religion, why some intelligent people are not interested in religion. And she wrote an article. She said, why we 170 million Nigerians are stupid. That's a provocative title. And then she made her case. Underlying Nigeria, but what she said about Nigeria applies to Ghana, applies to Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, all of Africa. She says, underlying the Nigerian put African stupidity is our unique ability to gloss over our ignorance. We deny it, we hide it under a cloak of religion. Cloak of religion. Abject ignorance about the nature of things and how the world works is projecting us into extreme stupidity where nothing exists in Africa except your enemies or demons or Holy Ghost fire. Churches and mosques are urging God to take up human duties. We grew accustomed to substituting inane stupidity for sophisticated religiosity. Our problems are many, our problems are serious and grave, yet we refuse to learn, we refuse to change or improve, we have elected to remain profoundly stupid. We become pew-hugging, minaret-clinging religionists who stand for nothing except invoking God at intervals to project unavailable righteousness. Our country's political discourse rests on pedestal misgovernance without commensurate and sufficient appreciation for materially inebriated, docile, and apathetic citizenry. Why are we content as setting new stupid standards every day? Bad roads, do you know the, the solution Christians offer? If there are bad roads, take it to the Lord in prayer. Comatose healthcare, our healthcare system is bad. Christian response, bad diseases will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Do you have a collapsed educational system from free SHS to whatever, a collapsing educational system, Africa's response, what will be, will be, our children will be overcomers. Do you have epileptic power, doom so? Christians say, may the, God, may the good Lord bind all the principalities, demonic spirits, and powers of darkness in preventing Nigeria from enjoying stable electricity supply. Instead of getting to study engineering to solve a problem, we are casting out the demons of darkness. Nigerians sit on their hands, praying for celestial edict beamed down to them from God's majestic throne. Will it be right for all loving God to bypass all other nations to grant good roads, drinkable water, electricity to the exclusion of other nations? And then this is the punchline. It is only in a country of the stupid that people will pray to God for what human beings must do for themselves. Good roads, affordable, accessible healthcare, electricity, clean water, etc. This is from her article, Nigeria and we. It's 170 million stupid people. That applies also to Ghana. This is our problem, a religious problem. But not only do we have problems, we also have solutions. We are capable of solutions. I'm now transitioning to the biblical point. We have a problem, but we are capable of solutions. And the solution I'm coming to offer this morning is Africa must think, Africa must do. We must be like the sons of Issachar who understood their time. They could think and they knew what they, Israel ought to do. They could do. I titled the lecture, Invent the Future for a Simple Reason. Typically, if I'm giving lecture, I don't like these 20 minutes lectures because they trouble me. I first want to warm up and get you thinking before we open the Bible. Let's just pause, bow your heads for prayer before we go on. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us, challenge us with the realities of who we are, as a people, where we are and where we ought to go. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Invent the future. That's my title. Including how we should do missions. I got the title from Thomas Sankara. You can tell I am a good fan of him because he's quite revolutionary in his thinking. He said, and I quote, 
you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. You have to be crazy to effect change. In this case, it comes to non-conformity. If you want to effect change, you must refuse to conform. Non-conformity. The courage to turn your back on old formulas. The courage to invent the future. It took the madman of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those madmen. And he said, we must dare to invent the future. Right in that statement, he uses the phrase, invent the future, twice. We must have the courage to invent the future. And then the very last line, we must dare to invent the future. That's where I got the title from. Ben Adjanim Watin has talked to us about why we must change our approach to missions. I am coming to talk about the resistance because it is a mindset we have, our leaders have, our members have. So anytime a person comes up with ideas, we misconstrue, we misrepresent, we attack them because we are not thinking. Africa's greatest resources, when I'm speaking to young professionals and students, I always say this statement, Africa's greatest resources are not in the land, but on the land. And this is more than a prepositional change. Our greatest resources are not in the land, our natural resources of gold, diamond, oil, etc., but rather on the land, the human beings who walk on it, our people. And when we talk about people, our ideas, our creativity, innovation, and ingenuity. Because the one who owns ideas owns your resources. Or let me say it different. The one who has ideas, the one who thinks, is the one who controls your resources. I got a, 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 a message yesterday from one of my young friends. He said, Dr. Pippen, I've been reading a book titled Killing Sacred Cows. And I know you are going to speak at Uplift 2022 and you'll be talking about ideas. And so he sent me a quote from this work by Garrett Gunderson. It, the book is about finances, why we need to change our thinking. And this is the important statement, talking about ideas. Regardless of the changing availability of any other service or substance, human ingenuity remains the one most important resource. Ideas are not and will never be scarce. And ideas lead to innovation, which leads to increased efficiency and the ability to use resources in ways that were previously unimaginable, as well as the creation of new and better resources. Then he concludes, human ingenuity is like a piano. Although there are a finite number of keys on a piano, there are infinite ways to combine the notes they play to create music. Ideas. Ingenuity, innovation, efficiency, creativity. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we are gathered here is to attempt to create ideas, to generate ideas. The musicians that were brought here are supposed to help us rethink even music. Let me make the, the explanation. I mentioned the point, he who has ideas owns the resources. The one who has ideas about missions control your church. Let me illustrate it with the cocoa industry again. The cocoa industry made up of chocolate and chocolate products is $150 billion. Only 6% comes to Africa. Only 6%. And yet we produce more than 70%. Africa has the resources, cocoa. But Switzerland has the ideas. And because it has the ideas, the brain power, Switzerland owns Ghana's cocoa industry. You can fly from Geneva, capital of Switzerland. The closest cocoa tree you find is in the Ashanti region. When a bird flies from Geneva, the closest cocoa tree will find it in the Ashanti region. They don't own cocoa trees, yet they have ideas. And because of that, they control us. Are, are you understanding? See, I have to make this case in many different ways for the, my message to stick. 
Compare Ghana and Switzerland. Switzerland and other Western countries like Germany and France, they earn more money from chocolate and cocoa products than Ghana earns from selling its cocoa, $2 billion. One-fiftieth of all the revenue from cocoa and chocolate products, Ghana earns one-fiftieth, even though we produce more, apart from Cote d'Ivoire. Why? We have the resource, but the Western powers have the brain. Not because we are incapable of thinking, but because we have a mindset that is resistant to change. Milo, which is Ghana's favorite drink. The manufacturer of Milo is a company called Nestle. Nestle is a Swiss company. We have the resource, cocoa. They have the brains. And guess what? So that's my point. Brains develop a nation or a church, not resources. When people start giving excuses, we don't have resources, we don't have resources, ignore them. Brains or ideas develop a nation, not resources. This is from Professor Francis Boche. He's now a professor at law at Qatar University. And another gentleman says, resources are not, they become. Whatever you have in your hand as a resource is not permanent. They become. And then I will say Africa must think. Why? I'm ending towards my point. Our problem is not our minds, but our mindset. Selfishness. African PAD pull him down, pull her down. Willful ignorance, superstition, colonial mentality, elephant in the zoo mentality. That is Africa's mindset. And it is endemic in the church. So on this Sabbath day, and this is a Sabbath day, God's holy day, Saturday, we have to drill into us that we are not thinking. I've already quoted this to you. Mediocrity in Africa is the new standard of excellence. I diagnosed Africa's problem in my three works on Africa. The heart of the African problem is the African mindset or the African heart. This heart or mindset must be changed. Ladies and gentlemen, I have made a case. In case I miss you along the line, this is the point I'm coming to make. And now watch two points from the Bible that knock out our problem. Let me state it again. The heart of the African problem is the African heart. This heart or mindset must be changed. Hence, we don't merely need educated minds, but transformed minds. And the Chinese will tell you, if you want one year of prosperity, grow grain. And Ghana produces grain. You can only get prosperity for one year. If you want 10 years of prosperity, grow trees. But if you want 100 years of prosperity, grow people. We need to start growing people, people who think. The reason China has taken over the world is when they were growing people who were growing grains. So we must grow people with a certain kind of mindset. What mindset? I've given Africa Must Think lectures, and I listed five mindsets we need to change. I'm coming to add one more today, which is the thrust of my mindset. I talked about the mindset of excellence, of entrepreneurship, and during the week you hear about entrepreneurship starting from tomorrow. Leadership development, you hear about it. Integrity, you hear about it. But today, I'm coming to add another point. A can-do spirit. We need to adopt a mindset that says we can do it. Others will say you can't do it. No, we can do it. And where do I get this mindset? I told you the message is very simple based on two or three Bible texts. Luke 137. Jesus says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. This is Dr. Luke, a physician writing quoting Jesus in one of his sermons, with God, nothing is impossible. How many things are impossible? Nothing with God. Matthew, who was a tax collector, an accountant, he also, referring to Jesus' sermon, you know, pulled out one point that Jesus said in the same vein. But Jesus looked at them, Matthew 19, 26, and Jesus said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. They are saying the same things, but slightly differently. Listen to it again. Luke says, with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing. 
That includes missions. That includes your finances. That includes your marriage. That includes everything. Nothing is impossible. Matthew says, with men it is impossible, but with God, all things. How many things? All, all things are possible. And Mark says the same thing differently. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Another condition has been added, if you can believe. So I am coming to challenge you to have a new mindset. If you believe, all things are possible. Ellen White, who is one of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, referring to Christ's statement, all things are possible, nothing is impossible, etc., etc., she has a statement, a one-sentence statement, in which she argues that impossibilities cannot prevent God. In the book, Desire of Ages, which is arguably the best biography on the life of Jesus Christ. You go to U.S. Congress Library, there are thousands of books on Jesus Christ. It is considered by one uh, uh, director of the, uh, the, the Library Congress says, Desire of Ages is the best autobiography of Jesus. In that book, page 535, Ellen White makes a case that impossibilities, things you consider impossible, cannot prevent God. This is what she said. This is the exact quote. He says, natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. You didn't get it. Let me say it again. Perhaps read that quote together with me. Natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. Anything you consider to be an impossibility, according to Ellen White, your impossibilities cannot prevent God who is all-powerful. So as you sit here this morning, is there anything you are thinking, oh, this is impossible? Immediately, think about what Jesus said. With God, all things are possible. So Jesus knocks it down. Ellen White also says, natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent. Are, are you understanding? I'm giving you some revolutionary ideas that can change your outlook on life. Are you a student and you are flanking your chemistry, your biology, your English? And you say, as for me, I can't do it. No, 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 no. Natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. Say amen to that. Are you worried that you never get a husband or wife? Natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. Are you following? Are you financially strapped? Natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. What is your problem? A church like our own, we are unable to reach out and win. Intelligent people, scholars, educated people. Why? Because, first of all, we are stuck in a mindset that thinks it is impossible. And secondly, because we don't believe in the power of God. Natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent. These texts from the Bible, Jesus Christ, as well as Ellen White, can arm a person with a can-do spirit, uplift. You are daring to hold a series of lectures that you think will change Africa. Yes, it is possible because natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. Say amen to that. In case you are a Muslim, let me read to you what Muhammad Ali also says about impossibilities. You've listened to Jesus Christ. You've listened to Ellen White, a Seventh-day Adventist Protestant. Now listen to a Muslim. Muhammad Ali on impossibilities. He says, and I quote, impossible, the word impossible is a big word that is thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they have been given rather than to explore the power they have to change it. Anytime someone says impossible, know that that person is a small person. His ideas are limited. Then Muhammad Ali continues, impossible is not a fact. 
Impossible is an opinion. When someone says something is impossible, tell them it is not a fact. It is your opinion. He goes on to say, impossible is not a declaration. A declaration is like a law. It is impossible. Muhammad Ali says, impossible is not a declaration. He says, impossible is a dare. Anytime someone tells you it is impossible, it is a dare. It must challenge you to make it possible. Impossible is a dare. Impossible is potential. Anytime people tell you this is impossible, you must say that something possible will happen and is about to happen. Is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. Isn't that what Jesus said? With human beings, nothing is possible. But with God, all things are possible. Are you getting this? On the basis of these Bible texts in the Gospels, Ellen White's statement and Muhammad Ali's statement challenging the myth of impossibility, we can develop a mindset that we can do it. Ghanaians, you are so tame and so docile. We don't believe we can do anything. Let me give a lecture like this in Nigeria, and you will see Nigerians rise up with that daring mindset. That's why I prefer Nigeria to Ghana. The Nigerian ethos, Niger no de carry last. They had determined that they would change the status quo. So get 10 Nigerians here. You think there is no employment here. The Nigerian will find employment and enslave you. That is the mindset we need. And you go to Western universities, most of the professors, especially in the math and IT departments, are Nigerian. They manage to go abroad and make a difference. Not us. impossibility. With God, nothing will be impossible. Luke 137. Matthew says, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Mark says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. Not because you have the power in yourself, but because the power resides in the God you align yourself with. Say amen. I come from a village, and so what? That should not limit you on what you can do. I come from a broken home, and so what? Are you the only person who is coming from a broken home? That shouldn't be an excuse. I have suffered failure in life, and so what? Who else hasn't suffered failure except Jesus Christ? My point is, what excuse are you giving that is limiting you? We need to develop a mindset of can-do in economics, in governance, in education. Every African needs to start embracing a can-do spirit. And that will extricate us or inoculate us from this mentality of mindset dependency. Let me conclude with this Bible text, which is about why God is able to do much more and we don't need to entertain this impossible mindset. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, and to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Say amen. This is the key Bible text according to the director of CAM that this year's Uplift 2020 is based. And to him who is able, we are talking about God. Let's analyze the text and see how powerful it is. That will change your mindset and you refuse to allow anything to limit you. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now the first statement that is made is 
God is able. And to him that is able. Human beings are not able. They will promise you they will fail. But God is able. If that's fair, say amen. amen. And the text says, and to him that is able to do what we ask. You see, human beings may be able, but when you ask them, they will not help you. They will refuse. But God is able. And he is able to do what you ask. What I ask. Say amen to that. But he doesn't end there. And to him that is able to do what we ask or think. Beyond even what you tell God, you ask God, God is able to do much more. He does also help you with what you are thinking. Do you get it? <laughs> he didn't end there. And to him that is able to do all. That we ask or think. You can think, oh, I, I'll ask this person, he can give me some here. But God, he can do all that you ask or think. It doesn't end there. The text says, and to him that is able to do above all that you ask or think. Amen? Are you getting the much more idea in here? And to him that is able to do abundantly, above all that you ask or think. Do you get it? Much more. And to him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. This is a revolutionary text challenging the myth. Of we can't do it. Africa needs to embrace the word of God. And the God of the word. So that we can rise up. And start making a difference in our world. In the classroom. In the academic area. In economics. Every field. We need Africans with a can-do spirit. Can-do spirit in our communities. In our schools. In our government. In our churches. Even in missions. Why? Ellen Why says, natural impossibilities cannot prevent the work of the omnipotent one. With men, Jesus says, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is the mindset we need. Wake up from the docile, we can do spirit. No, 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 we can do it. In missions. See, if I had had the time to present my original message, I will share with you. When people were saying, no, we cannot reach higher ups, etc., etc., I'll share with you how thinking outside the box and this can do spirit change our outlook. And by the grace of God, we are reaching influential people in societies, professionals, university campuses, students, diplomatic communities, scholars, journalists. And uh, Bernard Denim Watson told you recently, Beulah Church. Using eyes, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship as entering wedge to do missions, digital missions, training center, which by the way, they told us CAM is soon going to help launch a training center to train our new generation of African thinkers and doers. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa can think. Africa can do or ought to do. We must be the sons of Issachar of our times who understood their times and knew what Israel ought to do. That is the message for this hour. And it applies to also how we do missions. My lecture is over. Do you understand the message? Is it clear? Do you now understand why Uplift has assembled some of the best in the country, on, on the continent, to come here for us to begin changing the mindset. We need to start thinking. We need to start doing. We can do it. And let not your churches be the same, you know, churches like, you know, village churches only with English touch. No. Think. Let not your school fellowships be the same old ones hanging around and just eating, you know, rice and jollof. No, think. Enough of mediocrity in the system. We need new leaders. And you can be the leader of our time. 
I pray that the Lord would help us to develop a new generation of Africans, of Seventh-day Adventists, of Christians, even Muslims and other religions who are Africans, but with a passion and a burden to make a difference. It can be done, and now is the time. If the message is clear, and you want to be part of the change, I would invite you to stand as we pray. You know, you just stand. Usually, you go to church and conferences, people stand and make these altar calls because it has become normal. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we don't need this normal standing up. You must believe that if you are the only person, you can make a difference. And we need to. God's will, the director of CAM, I would invite you to come up front because you are coming to help us pray. We need a mindset change. Please, just come. Just come. Because we are giving too many excuses. We've become a continent led by chickens, and the eagles are silent. This oughtn't be the same. And so this week, you'll be challenged. Every morning, every evening, mostly in the evening to dare make a difference. God's will, lead us in prayer.